You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. So the primary aim for today is going to be to kind of preview the preseason game, give some hopes and dreams and all those kinds of things. Last week, um, it went fairly well, right? Elton Jenkins absolutely nailed exactly what I wanted to see. Although I also wanted to see some tackling, and there was none of that, so that didn't go great. That actually got worse. In fact, everything got a little worse, with the exception of Elton Jenkins. <laughs> I'm kidding. Some, you know, Alan Lazard stepped up, whatever. But we'll get into all that kind of stuff. Other than that, uh, just a couple of extremely random things to talk about. I don't think today is going to be a very long podcast, because I just absolutely refused to get out of bed this morning. It's pretty rare. I mean, I've had situations where I keep falling asleep, and then it's like, oh no, and then you kind of panic and jump out of bed. This was literally just laying there saying, nope, not doing it. I just laid there. Not productive. Just a petulant child in a very comfortable bed. Arms crossed the whole nine yards. That's a lie. I was on Facebook. Which is sort of like a petulant child to begin with, because there's nothing interesting on Facebook anymore. I don't even know why I go on Facebook. It's not interesting. I haven't cared about Facebook in like 15 years, which is like when it started. (laughs) All right, maybe five years. I I don't know, but it's just, I don't even know if I have friends on Facebook anymore. It's basically just a news source now. Just that and like funny videos. I should check to see if I have a friend left. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, I know I don't have any real friends left, but I would be interested to know if I have a virtual friend in this world. Before we launch into a series of things, I just want to... um... Remind and encourage all of you that uh, I do have a need for iTunes reviews. The show has been growing. It's quite nice. It's still not the most listened to podcast, though, as far as Packers podcast goes, and that annoys me because it is the best podcast. I mean, I'll be all right. I'm just worried about the other people who are stuck listening to those other podcasts. (laughs) I'm kidding. They're fine. There's nothing wrong with them. But they should know. They need to know. Just let the people know, man. Don't be so selfish. So if you wouldn't mind, the two things you could do to help if you have not done it yet, go ahead and leave a five-star iTunes review and a nice little comment that lets the people know that this is a real review and you do listen and you appreciate it and they should give it a try. The second best and probably better thing to do would be to share it around. You're at your doctor's office, let the people in the waiting room know. Just sort of announce it. Excuse me, ma'am. Reading the magazine? Have you tried listening to the Packernet podcast? If she gives you any lip, just smack the magazine out of her hand and storm out. Because we don't play here on the Packernet Podcast. We do not play. Okay? We go hard. And then we run away. I think you get the idea. You know what I expect of you. The final thing I have to ask of you is simply that I get a small piece of that big, sweet pile of cash you're going to win when you join the biggest NFL season-long tournament of all time. Because if we get enough of y'all doing this, and they're giving out $3.5 million in prizes, somebody's bound to win something. Even if it's a hundred bucks, in which case, after taxes, I would expect at least a virtual high five from you. I stand to gain from this. But in all seriousness, that would be very cool if somebody won something. And I would brag about that a lot. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, Draft is running a best ball tournament. 
these drafts are running every few minutes. You just jump in, you draft your team, they're going to automatically set your roster and give you points for the best players that you had for that particular week. At the end of 16 weeks, if you gather up a lot of points, you get a lot of money. That's kind of the end of the story. And for a limited time only, you can get a free entry into the Best Ball Championship when you make your first deposit, but you have to use promo code PACKERNET. That's right, a free shot at a million dollars just by using my promo code PACKERNET when you make your first deposit on Draft. Just search Draft in the App Store or go to Draft.com and come play free with promo code PACKERNET. Side note, if the promo code isn't working, please let me know. We've had some people say that, and I think we've also reached the point where I'm going to call them myself and ask them what's going on. Because just playing the, the middleman and passing along notes back and forth like it's middle school is just getting kind of old. So we'll get it all straightened out, man. Anyways, take a break and uh, jump into random thoughts and more. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have. Because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. So the first random note of the day, the XFL has officially released their teams. I'm going to get jacked up about this the same way I did about, um, I already forgot the name of it. It doesn't matter because it's gone. I don't think this is going to work. I especially don't understand launching a new team, and I, I understand it's it's hard to do a lot of teams, but how in the world are you going to compete with, like, eight teams? That just seems dumb. There There isn't a sports league in the world that has eight teams. I mean, maybe the NFL did in, like, you know, 1403 on the Mayflower. King Henry VIII and the Apostle Paul were getting down playing football. Listen, I know history, and I don't need you to correct me. Sports history, world history, food history, I got it, and I don't need your assistance. Point is, I don't understand how this is going to work. With that said, it's kind of fun to to form up an allegiance. So, number one, I'd be curious to know who you like. Throw that up in the Facebook group, link is in the description. My thought on this, I looked at each team for about eight seconds, one second per team, and I realized Dodge Viper is my favorite car, ergo Vipers are my team. Somebody else pointed out that the Vipers... Their colors are green and yellow, so green and gold, Packers, it just kind of fits. Also, they're in Tampa Bay, Florida's kind of my jam. Just It all just comes together, because in my mind, because, you know, I just assume by next year I'm going to be a millionaire and I'm just going to be flying around and doing whatever I want, which basically means I'm going to be in Florida six months out of the year. It's just going to be an excuse for me to go down and check out that team, like, hey, man, the, the Vipers are playing, you want to go to Florida? We're just going to hop on a private jet and go check out that football game, which is going to be boring. And then we're going to hit the beach because I think it's Tampa, isn't it? I love that area. Don't even know. But those are my thoughts currently. Also, if you haven't seen, they posted a bunch of videos out there, which just goes to show that this is, despite feeling like this is going to be less WWE, which I still, I'm, I'm, I still hate saying that. I know it's been like 30 years, but it's the WWF, man. The World Wildlife Foundation can go pound sand. It is and always will be the WWF. It's like nails on a chalkboard. There's also, um, what is it? The Not the Defenders. That video was kind of cool. It's all like military and whatnot. The name itself is dumb. Just call them like the Marines or something. The Defenders? I mean, come on. It's like a 90-year-old lady came up with these names. Or like a 6-year-old trying to be cool like, The Defenders! Because it sounds cool when you're 6 and you're super innocent and don't know cool stuff yet. The big, super strong, cool guys. However, the video was pretty cool, but the award for best video goes to the Gargoyle one. I forget what that's called, but that is sweet, and I'm very willing to switch my allegiance if the Vipers are trash. But either way, those videos kind of showed me that uh, Mr. McMahon just can't get away from the theatrics of it, which could make it awesome, but could also make it a joke and disappear very quickly. 
Either way, I just hope that this is a bunch of bajillionaires that pay a bunch of money to get great athletes and great whatever. Also, don't put it on cable. People don't know why the other thing died. I can tell you why it died. The first game was on regular TV. I watched it on regular TV. After that, they were all on cable. I didn't watch it. Nobody watched it. The ratings dropped, and it went bye-bye. Just put it on CBS so I can watch it, please. This thing isn't going to make money. Not in the first year. You just got to generate the hype and get it all jacked up. Make it through one season, get everybody super fired up and ready for next season. Maybe after two, three, four, five years, you start making money. You're going to be bankrolling this thing for a while. Trying to get massive cable contracts after one game. Get out of my face. And if you want to secure a contract, how about you be more forward-thinking and secure it with a company like Twitter? That way you get a lot of money, and you're super hip and cool, and I get to watch it for free. Just throwing it out there. Because in no universe am I paying for a cable package to watch the XFL. Never will that happen. I'm not even going to risk illegally ripping off a cable show for that. You're on your own, man. Anyways, random thought number two. I saw somebody um, throwing out there about, you know, data and stats and how they lie. I don't think that's the right way to say it. I don't think stats lie. Stats can be incorrect. For example, you could say that somebody had four sacks when they actually had five. That would be incorrect. But the actual stat would be five. It would be the correct number. If you can't do math, that's not the stats problem. That's a you problem. The statistic is the actual correct value, right? Beyond that, though, what people are talking about are the conclusions we draw from the statistics, which also is not the problem of the data or the statistics, right? If we, if we look at something, for example, Mitch Trubisky's uh, completion percentage went up, and if we just look at his completion percentage, he should be, I don't know, the 13th, 14th best quarterback in the NFL. There's two things at play here. There's the statistic, which is his completion percentage, which is correct and is not lying, Then there's the conclusion we draw from the statistic, which is dumb, and that's us trying to say something that the statistic is not saying. The data isn't telling us any conclusions whatsoever. We're just taking them and trying to make sense of them, and we are terrible at that. Partially because we're just not very good at understanding things, and especially when we're trying to defend the indefensible like Trubisky's a great quarterback, we tend to look at very shallow statistics, where advanced statistics give us a better enough picture to explain why he's not a very good quarterback. But even then, what I think it points to is the complexity of football, right? Data and statistics and analytics can kind of paint a pretty good picture of baseball. You can't do that with football. Now, I think you get a better and more clear picture the more data and the more analytics you have, but I just don't think you can paint a picture. There are just too many variables. I mean, the, from the player themselves and their own issues and their own personal life, their, their injuries and ailments, their mental state. The fact that it's just kind of up and down. There's the opposing team you're going up against. There's the players you play with and how that fluctuates. There's the quality of the players you're playing with and how they all fluctuate. So think about that. In in baseball, you're a pitcher. You have good days and you have bad days. And that's the fluctuation in itself. Now imagine Aaron Rodgers and him having a good day and a bad day. Now you couple that with, you know, David Bakhtiari. Is he having a good day or a, a very good day? Lane Taylor, good day, bad day. Down the line, everybody else. So all these variables also affect Aaron Rodgers. Then Devontae and Marquez and Geronimo and Vitali and Aaron Jones. These all affect Aaron Rodgers and his production on top of his own, you know, is he having a good day or a bad day? And then you got to go through every single player on the defense. How good is the defense overall? But each as an individual component, how are they doing? These specific matchups between this player and that player. Devontae may be having a bad day, but so is the cornerback, who's not been that very good to begin with. So even though he's having a bad day, Devontae's just... Ta- you know what I'm saying? It's, it's ridiculous, the amount of variables. And it's impossible to look at a statistic and try to come up with anything. And the analogy I would have would be kind of like telling an artist you have to paint a picture of a beach, but you can't look at the beach. I'll bring you some sand and you figure it out. And bringing like a, a sack percentage of a player would be like bringing a handful of sand and be like, all right, paint the beach. It's like, I, I, okay. And there's also good statistics and bad statistics. For example, I could bring you sand. I could bring you the sand on top, which is the right golden color. Or I can dig straight down and bring you a lot of that dark brownish, you know, real wet stuff. That So then you're going to have a picture of this sand, which is not the right, even the right color. So even though the beach doesn't look anything like the beach that I'm trying to get you to paint, it also isn't even the right color. The sand is weird. On the other hand, maybe you could like bring a little sand, some of the grass, some of the foliage and all that stuff so they get an idea of what the surrounding landscape looks like so they can at least get an idea of what kind of trees and things are around there, even though, you know, how big the beach is, 
where that grass line is, how much, you know, it's, you, you, you're never going to be able to create the picture. But the more data and information you have, you can kind of create a better picture, but it's just never going to get there. So I do like data, and I think teams are using it a lot, and it's important. But I also think that's why you can get too carried away with data, and there are some just absolute truths in football that just sort of bear themselves out. That's why things like emotions, things like locker room and all that kind of stuff, that, that all really factors in quite a bit, and maybe more so than in other sports. But anyways, to, to say that statistics lie, I just don't think is, is the case. Statistics can't lie because they're not making claims. They're just giving you information. You're making claims, and your claims are garbage because you don't know how to read the statistics, or you think that the statistics are telling you something that they're not. But Aaron Rodgers' completion percentage is not a lie. The conclusion that he's a garbage quarterback because it went down, that might be a lie, but the statistics didn't tell you that. Bears fans told you that because they don't know how to read. That's science. I told you it was a random thought, man. I'm just saying. Stats don't lie. They might be useless, but they don't lie. Anyways, let's talk about some preseason action. So, uh, again, I'm just going to kind of run through position by position here. It's how I roll, and we're going to start with quarterbacks. I'll be completely honest. I really don't expect Aaron Rodgers to play. I I just, maybe he will. I I kind of want him to. I know the risk is is ridiculously high, and and for that reason, I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to throw a fit if he doesn't play because it means definitively he's not going to get hurt. And that, that is the biggest goal for all these players going into it. That's I, Let's get that out of the way right now. The biggest goal for everybody, don't get hurt. If you do that, you've passed the most important test. But I, I, I just, just get the cobwebs out a little bit, you know? Just one drive down the field, you know, touchdown, field goal, whatever. I mean, just, just get to the 30 and then pull Rodgers, see if Boyle can punch it in. Yeah, I said Boyle because I don't really care. Give it, to, give it to Manny. And then if and when he can't, just kick the field goal and we'll call it a day. I know there's a lot of disagreement about that, and I, I, I really don't care because it's, it's, it's like a 50-50 issue for me. I do think it's important that he gets as much playing time as possible because he's a human being and he needs to kind of get in the groove, and I would rather him kind of, you know, shake out some of the old dust in the preseason than for ha- to have him do it against probably the best defense in the NFL in week one. Right? I don't want him to, to kind of get in his groove at halftime especially with the new offense and all that stuff. But the, the the very real and very serious risk of injury, again, if that's where you're at, definitely not going to fight you on it because it's, it's, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. As for the other quarterbacks, I, you know, I'm kind of to the point I just don't care anymore. Because even if they have a, a good game, we, we've seen Deshaun Kaiser have, I don't know if I would say he's had entire good games, but he's had good series, good drives, good quarters, maybe a good half if he's ever played a whole half and it was decent. I don't know. But th- 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 there's almost nothing any of these guys can do to make me think, you know, maybe they could play in the regular season and win us a couple games. It just, no. Completing, you know, seven of eight passes for 94 yards and a touchdown is not going to undo everything we've seen. That would be great, and it would be hopefully a a move in the right direction and maybe it alludes to him starting to understand the city whatever it would be nice but I kind of just don't care the the biggest thing that I want from the quarterbacks is to not be a hindrance to this offense and the people trying to win a roster spot right there are wide receivers who need good balls from you so that they can go out and win a win a job and the offense needs to be on the field long enough to to get some reps the offensive line the running backs etc I mean, I'll be, I'll be honest, I'm almost happy when the offense is punting because I want to see more defense because I'm just excited to see it. But these offensive players need some reps, man. And a lot of it's on the offensive line needing to block better so we can actually run for more than negative three yards. But I, I just, I just want to see some good offensive play. And not because I expect there to be any correlation between the offense playing well now and in the regular season. But again, just these guys need to play more. And if all we're doing is punting because we can't convert for its first downs because the offensive line can't run block and our quarterbacks can't throw passes, that's a very unfortunate situation. Um, for the wide receivers, you know, it, it's very similar to last week. I think we're, we're I, I guess I don't know if we're getting clarity. I, I kind of lean toward us getting clarity because Trevor Davis was hurt and Alan Lazard really stepped up and Darius Shepard really stepped up. So it's kind of like, all right, maybe we're starting to drop Trevor Davis now. But Davis is back. And if he can perform... And, and, and be a, a top-flight receiver like he has been prior to his injury and whatnot, he's back in the running, and we're back into this this problem. And again, it, it's I would like clarity, but I kind of don't want clarity because I, I would like for all these guys to go out and play 110% so that this is a very tough decision. Now, on top of that, it hasn't been great for guys like Marquez Valdez-Scantling. That doesn't really matter 
because Devontae hasn't even graded out well in the preseason. I don't know if it's guys taking the foot off the gas. I don't know if it's specific play calling to, to try to highlight the guys that, because it's all the guys that need to perform well are performing well. So they're getting a lot of the targets. They're probably the primary read on a lot of these things because the, you know, these are the guys being evaluated. Devontae is not. So it's not super concerning, but it is a little bit, you know? Can, can we see EQ do something cool like Marquez, Devon, like any of these guys that are actually going to be playing? And I'm guessing if Rodgers is out there, it's going to be the Devontae Adams and, and you know, Geronimo. And, and his primary guys are going to be the ones getting the ball because that's just how this goes. These are my guys. I intend to score. And um, your evaluation can stuff it for a drive. But that would be nice to uh, to be able to see that. But otherwise, I, I just want these guys to keep it up, you know? I mean, it's it's they're, they're, it's they're several underdog stories, right? Darius Shepard should not be doing as well as he is. Alan Lazard was never expected to do as well as he is. You know, Jay Kumaro, I guess you kind of expect it, but y- you want to keep seeing it, right? Because it's a very tenuous thing about him actually making the team. Anybody that comes undrafted, especially from a, you know, a D3 school like Whitewater, there's just, there's no expectations. And um, you just, I mean, you just, you want to root for him. Trevor Davis, same exact situation. It's just going to be absolutely devastating to have one of these guys just have a terrible day because it's such a tight race. One bad day might kind of get you kicked off the team. It shouldn't, and it's not, but it, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's kind of, well, what else are we basing this on? Right, Shepard had a bad day. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, so what do we do? We keep Shepard and dump Lazard, who had another good day, or how are we handling this? Um, Jamon, I, I would love to see Jamon have a good day, not because I think it's going to make a difference, but just because I'm, I'm to the point where I just feel bad for the guy. Really talented. Everything is right there in his hands, and it's slipping away, and that is a terrible analogy, and I am sorry, Jamon, if you're listening. <laughs> that was not intended. His opportunities hit him in the hands. <laughs> Oof, that was brutal. But it is tough, man. I mean, it, it, you know, you see all these stories about guys getting big contracts. They put in all the work, and they've been grinding since they were kids. And all. jamon has been putting in the same amount of work. He just maybe doesn't have the ability, and, and after all that work, what is it going to culminate into? I mean, if he doesn't get this hands thing figured out, it's not going to culminate into him making any teams ever. He's going to bounce around for several years, practice squads, whatever, maybe another year or two before the NFL just puts a big red mark on your file and you don't have another opportunity and you have to go out and get a job. It's not, it's not fun, man. I, mean, I'm, that, I legitimately feel bad for, for a guy like Jamon. Especially since he was drafted higher, because it tells you the level of talent he has, right? He was drafted ahead of EQ and and, uh, MVS. So that, I mean, the talent is there. It just, I don't know, it stinks. But you get the point, right? I want to see Shepard, Lazard, Kumaro, and Davis especially just going at it. Because I've got Devontae, EQ, Marquez, and Geronimo Locke. And there legitimately may just be one more spot. I I tend to think there's going to be at least two but there could be as little as five guys on the roster, which would mean between Trevor Davis, Jake Kumaro, Alan Lazard, and Darius Shepard, there's one spot available. And for some of those guys, like Darius Shepard, is, as much as, I mean, he is the highest graded receiver through the preseason for the Packers and by a lot. But it, it uh, I tend to think that there's already an order. And I think a lot of these guys are already, I don't, I don't want to say off the team, but headed toward the practice squad. Darius Shepard and Alan Lazard, I think, are sort of on the, the lower tier, Jay Kumaro and Trevor Davis are upper tier. And I think if, if the season ended, or, you know, if, if the preseason ended and we were keeping six, it would be Trevor Davis and Jay Kumaro. So really it's up to Derry Shepard and Alan Lazard going above and beyond. And I think Shepard's probably above Lazard, to be completely honest. But, you know, Lazard is, but, but that's kind of the point, right? Lazard has to go above and beyond, and he is, which is part of the reason why this is so, I, I think they're actually really close. There's also the separate dynamic of I think it's going to be Shepard or Davis. I think they do want to keep one of them for the special teams ability. It's a matter of are we just sticking with Trevor Davis, which is going to be dependent on can he be a wide receiver, or are we moving on from Davis, who again, is, is we, I mean, he's going to be looking for a contract pretty soon. I don't want to have to pay him a contract. I would rather use Darius Shepard. So, you know, we, we have the opportunity if we want to, to put Darius Shepard on the practice squad, which is great because then we can, you know, still keep Trevor Davis and keep Darius Shepard, assuming we don't lose Darius Shepard. On the flip side, we also want to put Darius Shepard ahead of, of Trevor Davis because it's just a better situation to have a younger guy. I don't, I don't know. It's very convoluted, but it's also kind of kind of exciting and it's very interesting to see what they're going to do. But either way, yeah, they, they need to continue to play really, really well. Darius Shepard, especially on special teams, is going to have to keep showing up. Hopefully it's just a light show between Trevor Davis and Darius Shepard, and hopefully they get a lot of opportunities. 
And also, any drops or, or fumbles or anything on special teams is going to be pretty devastating for either one of them because that could also be the, the just the end of it. Um, running backs, I believe Aaron Jones is playing. And, um, I, I, you know, th- it's, it's going to be kind of important if he does. And, I you know, again, it's preseason, and he's not going to get that many snaps if he plays. But a lot of people seem to think that it's not really a blocking issue as much as it's a we don't have Aaron Jones on the field issue. I, I know Aaron Jones is going to make more – of a bad situation than some of these other guys, but I do think those people saying that are really understating how bad the blocking has been. Now, it's a different team, so maybe, you know, the Baltimore Ravens, a lot of depth, a lot of pride in that defensive line. They do a real good job on defense. Maybe it'll just be better. But if the blocking, um, the run blocking along the offensive line is as bad, I I think think if people see Aaron Jones not able to gain yards, that's when Packer fans are going to go into full meltdown mode. Some of them have been in meltdown mode since before the preseason. For one guy in particular, meltdown mode started when the Packers picked um, Rashawn Gary at pick 12, and he has not recovered since. But that's going to really start to upset people. But either way, that's something that um, it needs to be worked on. Again, I've said it a thousand times. If you look at the Titans, go back if you have Game Pass and watch Week 1. They could not run the ball to save their lives. By the end of the season, they had one of the most dynamic run games in the NFL, right? It's a complicated thing. It takes some time to learn. Give it time, be patient, but also expect things to be kind of bad. And I don't expect that to change come week one. You have an offensive line that has never really been very good run blockers, learning how to to run a different scheme, which is problematic. You have running backs learning a different run scheme, and you have the Chicago Bears front. I don't expect very much. But they need practice, 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 practice. So hopefully there's a lot of running the ball, and the offensive line gets a lot of reps and a lot of practice doing it, because they have to get better at this. Since we're already talking about it, let's talk about the offensive line. Elton Jenkins, come on, man. Hang in there, buddy. Number one pass-blocking rookie has not allowed a single pressure in the preseason. And actually, I just looked at this. He's not just the best pass-blocking rookie. He is the best pass-blocking offensive lineman in the entire preseason. Andre Dillard, who was drafted by the Philadelphia Eagles, is number two. So, you know, obviously, again... Not really expecting this to be all-encompassing, it's preseason, all that stuff. But still, this is a good sign. And last week what I said was, maintain what you've been able to do in the pass-blocking arena, but grow in run-blocking, and that's exactly what he did. His pass-blocking in week one, from week one to week two, went from 87 to 84, which is a, it did go down a bit, but who cares? His run-blocking, though, went from 35 to 63. 63 is average, and it's also about as good as, as a Packers offensive lineman will get. I think Lane Taylor had like a ridiculously good run blocking grade. Outside of that, 60s is, is basically quality run blocking from a Packers offensive lineman. So, if, I mean, if, if he can go three in a row with a pass blocking grade in the 80s, and at least, I'm, I'm not even expecting a jump anymore. If he can maintain mid 80s and a run blocking grade in the 60s, I'm super excited about Elton Jenkins. I'm not even going to be greedy and ask for growth. Just maintain this, and I'm I'm pretty jacked up. Um, otherwise, for the starters, it really is just a matter of stay healthy. Um, I don't know what's going on at right tackle. I would be curious to see Billy Turner at right tackle, because I guess I'm just curious. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the depth, right? So El- Elton Jenkins, I want to see if he's going to win the job. I'm curious about the, the offensive tackle depth. You know, how, how does Billy Turner compare to Alex Light? I'm hoping Billy Turner is a much better right tackle, but I'd like to see it, right? If, if Balaga goes down, do we have a quality right tackle or not? I would like to know that. Um, you know, guys like Cole Madison, he, he's been quality, but he's definitely a bubble guy. So hopefully he can continue to grow and to step up. And considering all he's been through and taken a year off, he has definitely exceeded my expectations. I know a lot of Packer fans have been high on him, and he's going to be awesome. I came in saying, let's kind of pump the brakes. He was a late-round pick. He's taken an entire year off. There's no reason we should have high expectations. But he's 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 meeting those relatively high expectations. Granted, these are probably third-string guys, whatever. Either way, he's doing a good job. Um, another guy that um, very low expectation, but hopefully he can keep it up, is Mr. Yash Neisman. He's actually currently ranked as the number 12 overall pass blocker throughout the preseason just above Riley Reef, who is a starting tackle for the Minnesota Vikings. He is the fourth highest graded tackle, so 12th overall lineman in pass blocking. Terrible run blocking grade, but that's to be expected. Um, and also, the, there's a packer in between those two. Justin McCray is number nine overall 
for pass blocking offensive linemen. So again, I I have not been that biggest McCray supporter, but that's me saying I don't think he's a quality starter. As a backup, I like Justin McCray. He's got the versatility to play center, guard, and tackle. I think he improved from year one to year two. I don't even think that's that's questionable. And he's having a real good preseason so far. So I'd like to see that continue. I do like having Justin McCray as a backup. Now that we have uh, Billy Turner as our right guard, I, I think as far as the backups go, Justin McCray is is you know one of the better guys that we have. So it's good. I've, I've been saying for a while we got to fix this offensive line, and, and to have an offensive line that seems to be solid, you know, from from left tackle to right tackle across the board. I you know depending on what happens with Elton Jenkins and Lane Taylor, and depending on Billy Turner and his aptitude at right guard, this could be a very very good offensive line. Beyond that, though, the depth of it to to have Justin McCray now as a backup, I think, improves the quality of our backups. If if again, if Yash Nijman can continue to improve, that's awesome. If I, if Elton Jenkins is a backup, that's I mean, we've we've got a really we, we we would have multiple backups that could be starters on other teams. Let's just put it that way, which is what the Packers had in the past when they were dominant and had a great offensive line, which those two things are one and the same. Oh, jeez, i got to speed up here. Tell you what, let's take a break right now. It's a very random spot, but it's almost 5 o'clock, and i got to fly. So we'll take a break. We'll be right back. All right, moving right along. I don't have a whole lot of expectations for the fullbacks because Danny Vitale is going to be the fullback, and he's injured, so I believe Tommy Bohannon is going to be stepping in his plate. It's going to be cool to see formationally what they're doing, but he's not going to tip his hand entirely on, on how things are going to be running and uh, Bohannon can't do what Vitaly can do necessarily, so we're not going to see a lot or any of that kind of stuff, so whatever. Tight ends. I don't know if Jay Sternberger's playing. I'm kind of leaning toward he's not, but I really would like him to. Obviously not if he's not ready, but you know, if he's healthy, let's put him out there because, again, as much as we can say Aaron Rodgers maybe doesn't need it, a guy like Jace does. Now, the benefit is he doesn't have to start week one because we do have Robert Tanyan, and presumably we're going to have Jimmy Graham and you know maybe Mercedes. I don't really know. So he's got time to develop behind capable people. But again, I, I really like Jay Sternberger. I think he's got a lot of upside. My bold prediction of the year, so far at least, is uh, Jay Sternberger will be the tight end one by the end of the year. Whether that happens by talent or by injury or by trade or cut or however, doesn't matter. I said what I said. But I, I, I you know, I've, I've got faith in him, which is dumb because I always do this. I always put faith in a tight end and it always comes back to bite me. I've given up on corners. I don't know why I don't give up on tight ends, but I just I just don't. Uh, we already talked about offensive line, so let's slide over to defense. We'll start with corner just because it's, I don't know, because it's what I'm looking at right now. I just want to see good play. And ideally, it's not going to come from KB on Ento and Chandon Sullivan. It comes from Jair, Tremont, Jackson. You know, I don't think King is playing. I, I, I don't know who's going to be playing again. But I really just, I want to see the starters just dominate. I mean, it's, they haven't even been going up against good competition. They have not. The Texans' wide receivers are trash. The Ravens' wide receivers are trash. I mean, I, I know that there's talent. I really just want to see it. By this time last year, Jair, Tremont, Josh Jackson, they all had picks. And I think two out of the three, three out of the three had pick sixes. I think Josh Jackson and Tremont Williams had pick sixes. I mean, they, they were just blowing the lid off of everybody in the preseason, and we were super excited. Josh Jackson and Jair are going to be awesome. Josh Jackson especially was showing off. Tremont looked real good. At this point in the preseason, it's like, what are these guys even doing? And again, no need to panic. Just saying, I want to see it. Overall, though, defense in general, tackling has to get better. Please, please. And I'm not even going to put the preseason thing on it. Because it's so bad, right? If you compare it to the 31 other teams, so bad. They said the, the, the team in second place was the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons have played three preseason games because they were in the Hall of Fame game. They're still in second place. And it's not just backups. It's also starters who are missing a bunch of tackles. It has to stop. They're, they're playing fast. They're playing physical. But it, they, they just can't finish, right? Get to the guy. Hit him hard. But don't bring them down. Just it's it's not good enough. It's almost good enough. We're right there. It looks good, but then the guy just keeps running, and it's it's like this really cool flat. It's like a guy that does, you know, like in those slam dunk competitions, and he does all kinds of crazy stuff, but then he just misses the dunk in the end. Executed like ninety five percent of it to perfection. It was very cool looking, but the goal is to get the ball in the circle thing, and you you didn't do that, so that doesn't work. 
Um, safeties, I'm, I'm good with just continued steady growth. Adrian Amos, I think, has looked pretty good. He hasn't been super flashy, but I don't think we're expecting flashy. We're just looking for a, a solid tackler, a guy that, that does his, his job and, and, you know, holds to his assignment and whatever. Savage, we saw a little bit, right? He, he's been kind of eased in. And then last week, we got a little bit of a flash with that pass breakup of him being able to run with a guy, obviously extremely fast. Um, there was another highlight I saw on Twitter of him, which essentially was him just coming from kind of deep to come up and make a tackle, which is, again, that right. what we saw on film when he was in college is what we want to see in the pros. And being able to close a gap really fast is what he was good at. So, you know, he hasn't been necessarily blowing anybody away. But I think the steady growth is a good thing, especially when you have the entire team essentially regressing, right? We were bad in week one, even worse in week two. Any guys that are kind of holding their own, getting slowly better, Darnell Savage is, is kind of that way. He's getting very limited opportunities, and the opportunities he's getting, you're seeing slow, steady growth. That's awesome. Just please continue that. I'm not going to say I demand a pick six or anything. Just, just continue to get better. Um, otherwise, I mean, Raven Green, I think, has been... I don't know about everything that he's doing, but as far as the tackling, the physicality, the playing fast, I mean, he just looks solid. He looks scary. I mean, he's he's sort of that enforcer type. So as I've said, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know if Ibrahim Campbell is playing, but those are my guys, man. Adrian Amos, Darnell Savage, Raven Green, and Ibrahim Campbell. And Raven Green was not my guy, so I, I don't want to try to sound hypocritical here. I wasn't big on him. But again, with with I, I don't want Raven Green to be a starting free safety but with Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage, we have the opportunity to use a guy like Raven Green for what he does best. You don't have to do everything because you're not a do-everything safety. You're just, you're Raven Green and you do Raven Green type things. So as a unit, I'm, I'm excited about these safeties. Uh, linebackers, I mean, it really just comes down to Ty Summers and Curtis Bolton got to tighten it up. I know, again, Curtis Bolton, the, the narrative is he's had two really dominant weeks. The reality is he had a really good week. He had a second week, which had a lot of highlights, but also had a lot of lowlights that nobody's talking about. He's got to tighten that up. And the reason it becomes urgent is because these guys are going to be starting. You know, as much as you can look at it and say, man, they can really develop. And I I think it's a decent unit combined, right? Curtis Bolton is, is an enforcer. Ty Summers has a lot of athleticism. Maybe you keep them both and use them situationally next to Blake Martinez, right? You know, if it's a running situation, you got Blake and Curtis on the field. Maybe in a passing situation, you put Ty Summers out there. Otherwise, you know, throw a safety out there. Maybe put Raven Green. I, I don't really know, but you've got a little bit of flexibility. But the bottom line is, come week one, again, it's just the preseason's done. There's no more time for, well, we're still developing. We're still, no, dude, you, you have to be a starting linebacker today. You have to know what to do. So, you know, the the increased pressure is on them. They, they don't have, you know, they're not number three or four on the depth chart where they have time to, to play only when it's optimal for them. No, dude, you're, you're out there. Now, again, it, you look at last year, because we didn't really have a solid number two, it was basically Blake and a safety out there most of the time. So there's going to be limited snaps, so that'll be fine. But bottom line is, we, we, I just want to see somebody step up. And if Curtis has another bad week, again, not what people think happened, but it is what happened, then it's kind of like, well, maybe we just don't have another linebacker. Um, the guys up front, I think, have been handling their business. I know the the run stopping hasn't been fantastic, but uh, you know I'm not worried about Kenny Clark. Tyler Lancaster has been one of the best performers throughout the preseason. Uh, you know, and when you couple that with what he did last year, Tyler Lancaster is just a, a slam dunk. It's one of those late round guys that you don't expect much from that is just playing as though they were drafted early. I mean, it just it happens. You get early round guys that bust. You get late round guys that that definitely got miscast by the the scout. Because they, they missed on it, and the Packers were lucky to be the ones to pull the trigger. Um, otherwise, I don't know. I mean, you'd like to see Montrevious kind of kind of step up because he's going to be taking on a much bigger role. But I think as I went through the 53, I think yesterday for the defense, this is pretty solidified, depending on how many they keep. I mean, there's, there's clear starters, and then there's guys that I just don't think are going to make it. So, you know, I, I think there's guys like Tyler and Montrevious and uh, Kingsley Kiki, you just want to see that continued growth. Kingsley Kiki, a lot of people super impressed by him. Depending on who you ask, he's been the most impressive rookie so far. Um, it's, a, it's a good thing, and, and, and he is in a situation where he's got some limitations, but because of the amount of people, we can put him in when it's optimal for him to be in. You know that That's partially true with the defensive line because part of it is just rotation. These guys get tired, so you have to go in, and it may not be when it's most optimal, but we're going to try to make sure that it's at optimal times. Primarily for Kingsley Kiki, I think it's going to be pass rushing situations because he's, he's got some pretty, pretty decent uh, penetration moves because that's a thing. And then edge rush, I mean, man, 
something. Got to be something. Because it, it's, it, you know, again, I, I understand the whole preseason thing, but I, I just don't care. People are getting sacks left and right. Guys that aren't even that great are getting a ton of sacks. So Darius Smith is talented enough. Got to see something. You know, the, the, the Raiders don't have the worst offensive line in the world, that's for sure, but they also don't have mobile quarterbacks like the previous teams have had. And the fact of the matter is they, they've invested a decent amount in their left tackle, Colton Miller, um, but he, he was not very good last year, so there is an opportunity to come off the edge there. Derek Carr is not a mobile quarterback. Nathan Peterman is not a mobile quarterback. Mike Glennon is not a mobile quarterback. All of these guys are sticks in a pile of mud. Maybe not Derek Carr exactly, but he, he, he's not a mobile quarterback. And especially for guys like Rashawn, because when Derek Carr comes off the field and you got Nathan Peterman and Mike Lennon and you have a second-tier offensive line, which I can tell you right now, they're, they're just trash. So you've got a quarterback that can't move and you've got a trash offensive tackle you're going up against. I mean, I you got to show something, man. You've got the talent. Just put something out there. Again, I liked week one. I thought he did a great job of beating the tackles and him being able to get around a tackle and get to the quarterback in about two and a half seconds, but the ball came out, I'm not going to get on Rashawn about that. But like a lot of other guys, things went backwards last week, and I didn't see anything last week. So hopefully we can put something on tape this week. I'd like to see Zadarius. I'd like to see Preston. I'd like to see Rashawn. Right? These guys are the ones that are heavily invested in. Lots of money going their way to to be primarily pass rushers. Preston, I know, has some other responsibilities, but still, you need to be able to rush the passer. That's a big part of why you're here. You know, last last year you were at like 12-ish percent. Zadarius was pushing 13 percent, I think, as far as pass rush percentage. Those are good percent percentages. So, I mean, get, somebody's got to get hit. A quarterback has to go down. Has to. And especially when you start looking at the quality of these quarterbacks, again, as I said, the corners have to do a better job sticking on guys because the ball's coming out way too quick. And we're never going to get to the quarterback if the ball keeps coming out in two seconds because you guys can't jam a guy up and keep him off his route for, for a second and then cover the guy because his primary read is just wide open. Come on now. Um, otherwise, the specialists, I just want Mason Crosby to keep banging it through because, um, you know, I want him to stay on the team. And J.K. Scott had a phenomenal week last week. I mean, J.K. Scott, if, if he could even come close to doing that on a week-to-week basis, he will be the best punter in the NFL. That's why he was drafted. He was drafted to be that guy. At this point, it's just about consistency. We know he's got the leg. If he can just continue to do that consistently, we've got a phenomenal punter. So, anyways, that's about it. So, a lot of specific things, but really, it's just a. It, it really just comes down to stay healthy and don't embarrass us, right? You know, just I mean, tackle, cover. I mean, just just do the basics and don't get hurt, and it'll be fine. Those are the biggest things. But, anyways, I got to get out of here. You folks have yourselves a fantastical Thursday. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. <laughs>